Today we are concluding our four part series on the history of Mercedes Benz. And let me tell you guys, the fourth quarter of this game gets pretty exciting. We're talking AMG. We're talking Hammer. Hammer. We're talking about the CLK GTR. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're talking about sickest. a car that was a McLaren, and they took the BMW engine out, and then they put the Mercedes engine yeah, in, yeah. and then they made it a street car, and then uh, they sell for $10 million today. And yeah, we get into the modern era of Mercedes Benz, including F1 and super fast modern road cars today on Pass Gas. Let's get into it. Let's be Benz Ginn. Let's Ben's Gin. I promise there'll be jokes that good throughout. <laughs> On January 1st, 1999, Hans Werner Alfresh was preparing to meet with Mercedes executives in Paris. 32 years earlier, he had left Mercedes alongside his friend Erhard Melker to establish a motorsports engineering company, AMG. In its first two decades, AMG had brought racing and performance prestige to Mercedes. And since the late 80s, the two companies had worked together as official partners to take on rivals at the track and on the streets. But in 1999, Alfresh was ready to sell a majority stake of AMG to Mercedes, effectively handing over control of the company. Now, as a result, Mercedes was prepared to charge into the new millennium, determined to continue setting the standard of the automotive world. Today, on the final episode of Past Gas's History of Mercedes, how did Alfresh and Melker form their tuning house? How did Mercedes make a triumphant return to racing? And how is Mercedes-Benz continuing to shape our world and the future of the automobile? Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. We're driven by the search for better. And listeners of the show get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash past gas. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Just go to indeed.com slash past gas right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash past gas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Big thanks to Chime for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Start building your credit. Open a Chime checking account with at least a $200 qualifying direct deposit to get started. Get started at Chime.com slash gas. That's Chime.com slash gas. We've reached the modern era of Mercedes-Benz. Yeah, We're yeah, finally yeah, talking about AMG, baby. You said his name like a... Like you were announcing a German DJ. You're like, coming to the set, <laughs> Al Fresh. <laughs> Al Fresh. Al Fresh. Al Fresh. <laughs> My name is Al Fresh. Al Fresh. Albert Fresh. <laughs> Sounds like a serial killer. Yeah, What's up, guys? Albert I'm Fish. Al Fresh. Al Fresh. I'm so freaking excited to play for you guys. <laughs> I'm so, so dang excited to play for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got a little boozy on the tracks. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Pass Gas, everybody. My name is Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my co-host, Rigid James Pumphrey. Get down from there! <laughs> Give me back my son. And Joe Weber. What the heck is up, Wig Wig Nation? <laughs> Wig Wig Nation. Uh, today it's our it's part four, the final part of our Mercedes series here. Uh, bringing it into the modern era, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited too. Yeah. It's been a long journey so far. Four weeks in a row of Mercedes storytelling to your ears, dear listener. We've you know, seen the 1800s. We've seen motor carriages. We've seen World War One. We've seen World War Two. We've seen World War Two. <laughs> <laughs> so now, yeah, let's finally bring it into the world. Uh, modern world, modern times. Now we're starting times. to get to the stuff I care about. That we know. I mean, the rest of you it know? is very interesting, yeah. but you know what? It is a lot. Up until this point, it's been a lot of horseless carriages mm -hmm. and Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> Two things that I never hung on my wall, no, and no. you can check on that. Yeah. There's record of that. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see a photo of your childhood. Better. Yeah, it was sick. Yeah, yeah, it was the attic. Do you think <sighs> it's lying around somewhere, like a picture of your? Probably your... not. There's not a lot of records of my childhood. Mm -hmm. It was like pre-smartphone. 
I had a Lamborghini poster, and then uh, at some point I had a Nerf Bonero, and I would stick pencils in the end of it and shoot it at the poster. So I just, I wish I had that Ferrari poster, so. guy, huh? Yeah. 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 <laughs> My parents yeah. don't get me at all. <laughs> Lamborghini. Yeah. yeah. I made a lot of weapons when I was a kid. Oh, me too. Yeah. I've been so to your childhood many, house. Yeah. Yeah, you awesome. stayed in my room. I love it. That yeah. was your room? Yeah. Oh, shit. It was purple <laughs> when I was in there, and there was graffiti on the wall. It was purple? Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Mine, my, in high school, I painted my room orange. Oh, uh, wow. Orange that? Is of choice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why oh, am I man. so well, mad? <laughs> yeah. Well, because originally I wanted, like, this real, like, radiant, like... Yeah. Aggressive. I want to wake up in the morning angry. Yeah. And my dad was like, Are you sure you want to do that? And I was like, Yeah. And he's like, Well, let's see. Let, let's get a, a lighter shade too. And we yeah. did three walls of the lighter shade yeah. and one of like. Oh, like an accent wall. That's cool. It was like caution vest, like <laughs> oh my God. orange. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I was, you know, I was like, You know what? Dads are all right. Dads are all right. They know some stuff. So like you were going to go all caution orange. I was going to go orange. all caution orange. I'm really oh glad God. it did. Yeah. yeah, that would have like affected your yeah. cognitive. Yeah. What? I think it did. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, Just listening to Stained. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, what also kind of sucked was like our high school color was orange. Our yeah. colors were orange and gray. Cool. Interesting. Combo, but like, like when uh, people would come over, they'd be like, "Yo, you, old Bucks colors." No, Bucks were uh, Red. purple and green. Uh, well, they people would come no, over and be like, years. "Oh, you must uh, really yeah, love yeah. the high school. You must really love. <laughs> yeah. You got a lot of school spirit." No, and I was like, "No, I just really like orange. I like orange. I like orange a lot. Yeah. I want to be upset. <laughs> <laughs> I still like orange. I like orange uh, a lot. I yeah. was thinking about how much. Like I was thinking about. I want to get a new." gauge cluster for my car like this guy yeah. on instagram will take stock gauge clusters and like you get tons of options mm -hmm. you get, yeah. do all kinds of different face colors sick and uh <laughs> i was thinking the other because bmw's lights are all orange mm -hmm. and i thought it'd be cool to have just my tack mm -hmm. face oh. orange yeah that'd be sick that'd and, be cool. and then i had the thought i was like do i like orange and i was like yeah i think in combination with black that's mm -hmm. a great choice yeah Halloween. Yeah. I think tax are like a pretty underrated way of kind of uh -huh. sprucing up your interior, showing some personality. For sure, tax are sick. Yeah, yeah. tack in a different color than everything else. Mm -hmm. That's a Very move. Cool. Yeah, it's a move. And show and you know thinking this through and coming to like an informed decision shows that you have tact. Ah, oh. uh, James, do you want to start us off? Yeah. All right. Then Hans Werner. Alfresh and Erhard Melchar. I don't mean to say that with disrespect. It's very hard for me. Met in the early 1960s while working as engineers at Mercedes, it wasn't obvious the two would be able to work together at all. Never mind take the automotive world by storm. According to Melchar, the two had a heated argument the first day they met because their temperaments were so different. <laughs> Melchar called himself a hardworking hippie. In contrast to Alfish's all business demeanor, I wonder if he knows the meaning of hippie, because like a hardworking German guy that loves cars <laughs> doesn't seem like a hippie to me. Well, he's a hardworking hippie, so he it passes mustard. It's like I'm a, kind of a free spirit, but I work hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I dot my p's and q's <laughs> because of the umlauts. <laughs> because of the umlauts. I dot my u's like everyone else. <laughs> if you look at some of the Mercedes, I don't know if he's responsible for this, but if you look at like some Mercedes interiors from the seventies, yeah. you can see some hard. But this guy's in there. AMG, isn't he? I know. Yeah, are... they worked at Mercedes. Okay, my bad. Their first don't experience. Don't get ahead of the story. Joe. Come on, Joe. Uh, Spoilers. Uh, they were like f like flower print interiors and some oh. wild interiors back then. Wild. So a little bit of a hippie. Their first experience in collaboration came from a renewed interest in racing, a first at Mercedes since the 1955 Le Mans disaster. The company tasked the duo with developing a racing engine for the 300 SE. And their different personalities were soon revealed to be a strength. It's like me and Jesse. Mm. Yeah. You're the hardworking hippie. Yeah. Jesse is the German. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By approaching a problem from unique perspectives, Alfrisch and Melker were able to identify issues the other missed and enable one another to work more creatively. In the end, they managed to increase the output of the 170 horsepower engine by 40%. 
But That's a lot. Before they had a chance to showcase the engine, Mercedes shut down the race team once again. Alfresh and Melker were determined to see the car hit the track. Unbeknownst to Mercedes, they spent the next two years working on the race car in their spare time. The project was approached obsessively and often at the expense of rest. At one point, Melker even collapsed from exhaustion while riding his motorcycle. Can we just refer to them as fresh milk from now on? Fresh yeah, milk. Fresh milk. Nice. Seems like a bad time to pass out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it also seems like, okay, dude. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm just, like, tired from work. It's like, okay. Better hop on that dirt bike. Yeah. <laughs> Once they felt the car was ready to go, they approached Mercedes chief engineer, Rudolf Uhlenhaut, and confessed... Every time I say like a German last name, I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> yeah. like that's what you got. <laughs> Rudolf Uhlenhaut and confessed to what they had been working on. Rudolf was impressed and gave the two permission to enter it without factory support in the 1965 season of the German Touring Car Championship. It won 10 races in its first season. Whew, this is lot. pretty um, <laughs> like lot, relatively lot. commonplace. Uh, for Mercedes. Like, this is kind of like Mercedes' MO a mm -hmm. little bit. They did this with the 190E as well. So, like, uh, they were developing the 190E uh, to be a race car, mm -hmm. compact car. They pulled the plug on the racing program. They developed it uh, in secret mm -hmm. again. And then uh, they started entering at races without factory support. Mm -hmm. Then after it won a bunch of races for two seasons, they're like, okay, maybe they were like, idea. okay, full yeah. factory yeah. race team, yeah, and just like dominate. That's wow. kind of lame, though. I mean, it's kind of maybe smart. Like they're like, okay, do it unofficially, and then if you do a really mm -hmm. good job, then we'll give it the beans and we'll throw everything. Out. But it's weird to like put all support behind them and then pull the plug when it's almost done. And then be like, well, yeah, I forget what happened. It's always something happens. Yeah. Like, it's always, I mean, it's business, baby. It's, it's business. business, It's always baby. like a new boss comes in, yeah. reprioritizes stuff, or like maybe they had a bad year and they got to like yeah. save money somewhere. Well, when, yeah. well when, yeah. we might actually cover this, so I might be like foreshadowing too much, but uh, with the 190, it was a new guy came in and he was really into motorsport. Well, all right then. Alfresh quickly recognized that success at the track was proof that their late nights and weekends had the potential to be more of than a hobby or an exercise in engineering. So he decided to leave Mercedes to form his own tuning company in late 1966. Yeah, baby. But knew it wouldn't be the same without Melcher. You gotta have that fresh milk. Gotta have Melcher. If I if it's not <laughs> Fresh, then it's just old milk. <laughs> <laughs> in a 2012 interview with Motorsport Magazine, the two recalled this critical moment. Alfra said, quote, Melker had so much intelligence and genius that I knew I would be successful with him. And Melker stated, Alfred was the real driving force to start a business, and he pleaded with me to do it. I didn't need him. <laughs> he needed me. In 1967, 29-year-old Alfresh and 27-year-old Melker established AMG. The A and M stood for their last names, of course. Oh, uh, oh okay. And then the G stands for Garumpak. Yeah, it stands for <laughs> Grossos Park. That's at the back of every German car company. I still don't know what it means, and I have never yeah. said it correct. <laughs> Grossos Park. Grosse Grosse Spash, Spash. which is the town where Alfresh lived when they first set up shop. Oh, I like that. Mm. The company was entirely focused on motorsport, and their first major project was tuning the 16-foot-long, 3,800-pound Mercedes 300 SEL into a race car. The nearly four-year project was primarily financed by the team, selling their revamped 300 SE engine to private racing teams and largely completed inside Alfresh's apartment. Melker later stated that, quote, The apartment was covered in drawings. And that the SEL's direct <laughs> injection system, the first ever designed and manufactured outside of a large company, was made in the basement. Wait, direct injection in the late 60s? Isn't that crazy? That's sick. Yeah. yeah. I don't even know what to think of that. Well, I mean, explain to the uninformed what. So the, 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 instead of having the like fuel injection system, even then, fuel injection at the same, yeah. at that time yeah, was largely Yeah, things were still carbureted at this time. Mm -hmm. And this was like a mechanical fuel, I'm assuming a mechanical fuel injection system. Uh, but even at that time, even though that was pretty advanced, you're still having your injectors in 
integrated into the uh, manifold mm -hmm. before the cylinder, before the valves. Yes. Fuel gets sprayed into the intake manifold, mm -hmm. mixes with air, then it goes into the cylinder, yeah. gets compressed, and past then the valve. Explodes. But the difference with a direct injection system is that your injector is in the uh, combustion cylinder alongside the valves. So all that's going into the combustion chamber. Uh, before the valves is air, mm -hmm. and this allows for just like it, it's more efficient mm -hmm. uh, because you know you're not wasting your vaporized fuel like on the walls of the manifold or anything yeah. like that. More fuel is, and you can like better deliver it uh, more precisely. It's like secondhand smoke versus smoke. Exactly. So there you go. So pretty advanced <laughs> for some guys in their apartment making this. <laughs> yeah, in their really basement. advanced for some guys in their apartment. It's amazing. Dude. So. The car was nicknamed the Red Pig. And that's it's what one this of, car yeah, is. Nice. It's one of the coolest it's race cars so ever. Sick. I've seen it in person a bunch. Really? I, yeah. I, this was one of the Hot Wheels that I specifically searched for. Yeah, it was. Uh, it used to be in the lobby of Beverly Hills Mercedes. Oh, no wow. Shit. When I worked for American Idol, it was right by my office, and I would go smoke cigarettes outside of there and look at them. That's sick. Yeah, yeah. So. so. I know. Cigarettes are cool. Not anymore. I mean, they're kind of cool. Yeah. Those, that's two cigarette stories in the last two minutes. Well, I also had a skull story. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it was named the Red Pig for its uh, red How many red heart paint attacks have I had? <laughs> and enormous size. AMG's 300 SEL made its debut at the 1971 24 Hours of Spa. Ugh, Despite several so changes to the car, including lightweight aluminum doors and a wider track width and a 500 cubic centimeter increase in displacement to 6.8 liters. That's a pig. That's a big boy. The heavy sedan was considered an underdog on a grid full of lighter sports cars. Well, well it's I mean, called dude, a pig not just because of its, its size, but also with the lights. It looks like it's got piggy face. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, and also the graphic design of this just livery so is just like second to none. Mm -hmm. It is so sick. And like the wide wheels on a, like it just doesn't look like it should be a race car. And then they did all the coolest possible I race know. car stuff. Should to we it. divulge a little donut? Lores, a little secret. It looks yeah. like Conifer made it. Well, that <laughs> yellow on the car isn't that the same as the donut yellow oh. we use? Yeah. yeah. What's the uh, Pantone code? FFD, FFD 515. 515. That should be our number on our next race car. 515? Yeah. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Joe. <laughs> Joe, did you know that Wink Wink Nation is our number one best selling shirt Whoa. all year? For the first 30 days. That's awesome. Yeah. Hell yeah, Wink Wink Nation coming through. Mm -hmm. According to Alfresh, as the race went on, he began to realize that they were winning the crowd over. No allowances had been made for the car's weight or engine size, and its fuel tank had been capped at the same 120 liter capacity as the 3 liter engine class. Despite its clear fuel stop it disadvantage, it and had to stop. Gotta get it's got to get gas more, more often. Yeah. The Red Pig did better than expected and even kept at the front of the field. When the checkered flag was waved, the 300 SEL had won its class and finished second overall. But Alfresh and Melker felt the pig was the real victor, since it overcame such a huge fuel disadvantage. Demand for AMG modifications to Mercedes vehicles exploded after the Spa victory and marks what many considered to be the birth of the sports sedan. Wow. Ooh, I love it. I Very love cool. this car. Yeah. And I love fast Mercedes. I'm so it's excited so about this episode. <laughs> <laughs> this thing is so cool. For weekend warriors to everyday adventurers, discover the 2024 Subaru Crosstrek. It comes standard with symmetrical all-wheel drive, designed to help optimize traction in rain, snow, on bad roads, or even when there's no road at all. A choice between two Subaru Boxer engines, a standard 2-liter or an available 2.5-liter, which is retuned for 2024 to deliver 182 horsepower and even more torque for responsive, confident acceleration. With 8.7 inches of ground clearance and X-Mode with hill descent control, which electronically optimizes the engine, transmission, and other systems for increased traction in slippery conditions, Crosstrek helps provide peace of mind on almost any road. These cars are super dependable, very capable. They've got a very durable exterior and new for 2024 and improved interior. This thing's awesome. Love is out there. Find it in a Crosstrek. Learn more at Subaru.com. Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. 
One of my favorite things about Indeed is that everything is all in one place. You know, how you connect with people, how you hire people, how you look at resumes. It's all right there on Indeed. It makes it super easy to hire people. And listeners of the show get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash gas. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Just go to Indeed.com slash gas right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash past gas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. What had begun purely from a passion for motorsport was shifting, and AMG began to take what they learned at the track to make road cars faster. They also started responding to customer demands for aesthetic and aerodynamic modifications. In describing this shift, Melker said, In the beginning, our philosophy to listen to customers was not really being implemented by any other large manufacturers. (laughs) They listened to what people wanted. Yeah. By comparison, Henry Ford famously said, if I asked the people what they want, they would have said a faster horse. Mm. But he kind of invented the whole thing. Anyway. By the (laughs) mid-70s, we increasingly got requests for exterior modifications in addition to technology. And we met them. (laughs) (laughs) This enthusiastic and increasingly deep customer base eliminated a need for marketing throughout most of the 70s. And AMG operated entirely on their track successes and word of mouth. That's sick. That's That's sick. Melker credited the customers here again, saying... They would say, my AMG Mercedes is as fast as a Porsche. (laughs) And they were. (laughs) It didn't hurt that the revenue was flowing. In 1970. It never does, baby. Never does, baby. Ask us how we know. Never get old. (laughs) Never get old, baby. (laughs) Never get old. Make money, never get old, the past gas way. <laughs> That's what donut stands for. Make money, never get old. <laughs> In 1974, AMG moved their 12-person team to a purpose-built workshop. And just two years later, moved their now 40-person team into a larger growth-friendly facility in... Affalterbach. <laughs> <laughs> Affalterbach, where they remain today. Despite nice. having no official connection to one another, AMG was important to Mercedes from the very beginning. Racing and performance cars were a crucial part of Mercedes history, and at a time when the brand had stepped away from both, it was AMG who kept this spirit alive and continued to bring high performance prestige to the brand. Is there a modern kind of analog to this where a brand is doing Brand is just making their cars, and then an outside tuning house is carrying the flag for them. I, I feel like be. a lot of OEMs. I feel like there's one like on the tip of my tongue. There's definitely ones that have like absorbed them, mm-hmm. like use the same model. Like Shelby's owned by Ford now. Yeah. Like AC Schnitzer, what are they? Only is... makes BMW stuff. Yeah. I'm saying like an out like in this way where AMG is the company that's like oh, like they're carrying the standard for Mercedes. Mm. Um, BMW has their own factory race team and stuff. Polestar? Polestar. A little yeah, bit. Yeah, for a while. Oh, Volvo's not, like, yeah. killing it. And they it. got absorbed by Volvo eventually, like much like AMG. Um, Gazoo? Gazoo, that's still in-house. I know. Yeah. Eh. I feel like we're in more of a monopoly era mm-hmm. where, oh, sure. uh, like, acquisitions are way more normal yeah. now so like it's eventually uh mercedes bought amg and mm-hmm. took like a majority share of it mm-hmm. but i think like nowadays that would have happened within like the first two years yeah mm-hmm. like they would have been like oh we should just buy that it yeah, would have yeah. been like a startup situation right yeah. exactly yeah. like no, we true. would have just like they wouldn't have let him go 20 years of yeah. just doing stuff they would have just been like oh you guys are doing good stuff mm-hmm. i mean the best thing we can do is just buy yeah. it mm-hmm. first yeah. we'll sue you and then we'll buy you. Yeah, first, yeah, we'll either <laughs> buy you or crush you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or buy you, then crush you. <clears throat> During this era, Mercedes engineers were solely focused on another crucial element of the brand a little thing that Nolan likes to call luxury. luxury. <laughs> 
In episode three, we talked about how luxury vehicles had become an integral piece of the brand's identity in the 1950s. And they had developed a customer base that ranged from wealthy to royalty. So not Nolan. a huge range. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just, uh, yeah. How many of your grandparents were rich? Okay. You're wealthy. <laughs> oh, yours. Yeah, you're royal. Rudy Ullenhout recognized this. And see how I say your German names? Rudy Ullenhout. <laughs> Rudy Ullenhout recognized this and once said the cost of producing the ultra luxurious 600 during the 1960s was of secondary importance. Quote, to the comfort and technology they could provide to their high profile clientele. I feel like this is in the last episode, I think they had kind of a similar philosophy to with the, the Goldwing production car it's like yeah. it doesn't matter how much it costs us it doesn't matter how much money we make on this car as long as it's filling that i'm referencing like, that that era that you're talking okay. about is what i'm currently talking about okay in this spirit they developed the s class a car that set and continued to set the standard for the entire segment when i see a new s class it doesn't happen too yeah. super often i feel yeah. like so nice. the clientele is kind of like branched out to mm -hmm. you know you uh, from wealthy to royalty. or they're buying SUVs or something. Uh, I still, but I'm like, oh wow, they, they, that's a choice, you know? Yeah. yeah well, there's uh, with like new markets opening up uh, in like China and Russia. Like once those countries were allowed to like participate in capitalism, mm -hmm. you can see a definite shift mm -hmm. in like fashion brands. Yeah. So like logos got bigger. Mm -hmm. Like that's when like the all over print, like Louis Vuitton started happening. That's the when the polo like, logo got huge. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah. Like Balenciaga was mm -hmm. like huge, like yeah. all over the place. Um, and that's like this new market, uh, wanting to like be like more audacious mm -hmm. and like, it's a new thing. So they want to show new it off. I call money. Yeah, because they're classless. Yeah, they. It is kind. Of, it is. It is kind of new money, but it's like not. They've had money, but it's they're not. They weren't able to participate mm -hmm. in capitalism in the same way that the Western world mm -hmm. was, and so like luxury cars are also uh, a reaction to that. Mm -hmm. So like yeah. Bentiagas, like Bentleys being really crazy, mm -hmm. uh, is a reaction. The Cullinan to that. truck, right? So like a. a S class to me is still like very like stealth well. Yeah. yeah. Like that's like or like a Range Rover. Mm -hmm. Like a S class or a Range Rover is like, oh, you're actually rich. Mm -hmm. You know what's I, really popular in China? Big vans. Big with really van. fancy oh, interiors. Yeah. I think that's a that's like a global move. trend now. Did yeah. you see the new Lexus van that has like a widescreen TV in the back and it has like no. luxury captain's chairs and stuff? It's cool. Yeah. When I was at Geneva um, there's like this one of the company one of the companies that like does those like yeah. outfits sprinter vans mm -hmm. uh -huh. and they had a bunch of them there and then the dude was like telling me uh, it's like a private jet for the road yeah, yeah I mean they're really nice yeah and he was telling me that like this one prince in like Saudi Arabia like built this like insane like multi-million dollar sprinter van with one seat <laughs> yeah because he, oh he was, was like, kind of like <laughs> he's like thinking about how cool that would be and then finally gets in it and he's driving around he's like and then he calls his friend kind of lonely back here <laughs> yeah, uh, like, yeah, I should have thought that. didn't even <laughs> not even an option well the guy was saying that like he's constantly like surrounded by people so like mm -hmm. having oh. the option to be like ah oh, it's just one <laughs> I, kinda, I, kinda uh, I wish I wish you could yeah. come but ooh. we you have 25 other cars yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah but, uh, you guys could just follow behind <laughs> That'd be the sickest Uber ever. I know. Picked up out of your house <laughs> yeah. <and> like, <laughs> yeah. There's like, like a partition. Dribble it. It's yeah. got hardwood floors. Yeah. Like dribble a basketball. There's in. an enrichment <laughs> area. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tracing its roots back to the 220 of the 1950s, the W116 S Class debuted in 1972 and firmly established the company's reputation for pioneering automotive technology. You see these around LA pretty often. Yeah. The W116 model had four-wheel disc brakes and independent suspension when it debuted, and throughout its yeah. 1972 to 1980 production cycle introduced other impressive and soon-to-be standard technologies like an anti-lock braking system and cruise control. Do you ever notice, like, especially in the diesel ones that you see around town, there's little badges on the grill, mm -hmm. little gold badges? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That you get one for hitting like a million 300,000 miles. Yeah. miles, you get one for hitting 500,000 miles, you get mm -hmm. one. So, like, if you see one with the you know four badges on it, that's an old car that's been you around gotta, the world. You gotta give that you gotta, driver a handshake, yeah, yeah, oh, give, a give little that salute. Car a What's the equivalent sandwich. of like the Jeep Wave, too? 
to of Mercedes. Mercedes. You know, yes. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get to, Almost got you. I'm not going to do it. I get demonetized. Nope. <laughs> nope, nope. <laughs> Many out of the... <laughs> <laughs> Many automotive journalists have said <laughs> that by looking at a contemporary S-Class, you can see where automotive technology will be industry-wide in 15 years. I would agree with that, for sure. It's a point that's impossible to argue. Throughout well, it, but no one but will we're going to try. try. Oh, I've, not, I've never even been in an S-Class. I think they're cool. Throughout its existence, the S-Class has introduced or pioneered the adoption of technologies like... Crumple zones. Hmm. No, Nolan, not crumpet zones. Aww. He, but you are drooling, though. <laughs> <laughs> he likes Put a nice the, craggy uh, crumpet. <laughs> Put on the kettle. Let him dry. <laughs> Airbags, voice control systems. Thanks for that one, dicks. <laughs> Keyless operation, my favorite. Parking assist, electronic stability control, and automatic braking. I don't like automatic braking. I understand why it needs to be in some people's cars, uh -huh. but whenever it kicks on in my car, I'm like, F you. Well, you I know I was up until recently preferred no braking why in your car. I used the regen system on my uh, yeah. hybrid oh, to brake for six months because I didn't want to change my brakes. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but back in the 70s, when Mercedes introduced the G-Class and began experimenting with alternatives to internal combustion engines, including electric vans, natural gas-powered buses, and methanol-powered cars. By 1986, as the brand celebrated a century of automotive development, Mercedes was evaluating its place in automotive history and where it wished to be in the future. In both instances, it saw AMG. The uh, G-Class... Uh, story is very very cool and very interesting. Mm -hmm. Nolan and I made a video about it. You can check it out That's on fun. our YouTube channel. Like uh, we'll put a link in your brains right now. HTTP <laughs> colon HTTP <laughs> HTTP <laughs> colon. Go check it out. <laughs> <laughs> the same year Mercedes celebrated its 100th birthday, 1986. AMG launched its biggest car since the Red Pig 15 years before, known as the Hammer. It was AMG's latest sports sedan. It was built on the SE platform and was often compared to the Corvette, 911 Turbo, and Ferrari Testarossa instead of its four-door counterparts. Although Melker had left AMG to form his own engineering company in the late 70s, he still worked closely with the brand he had started with Alfresh, and the Hammer had carried his mark. The hammer was more proof for Mercedes that AMG wasn't simply a company tuning their cars, but a company that embodied the history of the brand. Both sides were becoming more aware that a partnership was inevitable. They're for like, they like bumped into each other and they're like, what are we doing? And then they <laughs> kissed. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. like. You're in a relationship. I'm in a relationship. We got to wait until yeah. the time is right. Uh, finally, we are both single, and yeah. I'm excited for the summer. Yeah, that's how it happens, man. <laughs> <laughs> for a Mercedes eager to return to racing, AMG and their 20 years of racing experience with Mercedes-based cars was an obvious candidate to become officially involved with motorsport. At AMG, Alfresh went as far as to overhaul their manufacturing processes and quality control, later saying, quote, we had to be ready for the Mercedes star. In 1986, Mercedes began a tentative return to racing by supplying the Switzerland-based Sauber team at the 1,000 kilometers of Nürburgring and made an announcement with AMG that the two entities intended to enter into an official partnership. In 1988, Mercedes officially re-entered motorsport with AMG as their official partner and Sauber for its works team. And just as they had in the 1950s after a long absence, Mercedes immediately rose to the top. Sauber is still around. You might know yeah. them as the Alfa Romeo Formula One team. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, still kicking. In its first two years alone, its partner teams won the Driver and Constructors Championship in the ADAC Super Cup twice. Uh, all dads, all <laughs> cool. All dads are cool, <laughs> Super Cup. <laughs> Uh, they finished second in 88 and first in the 89 World Sports Car Drivers and Constructors Championship. They finished second in the German Touring Car Championship. They won a Class C driver's title in European Truck Racing. Oh, yeah. wow. And scored a 1-2 finish overall at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. European Truck Racing is like lorries, right? 
think so. Yeah, it's like those big old boys. Whoa. That would be a fun car <laughs> to drive. In the midst of this triumphant return to racing, Mercedes and AMG signed a cooperation agreement in October of 1990, which committed the brands to, quote, working together in the areas of development, production, sales, and service for per- passenger cars. The core outcome of this agreement was that AMG vehicles would now be sold at Mercedes dealerships, opening up new customer bases for both companies. Here we go. This is the start. Here we go. <laughs> sure is, Joe. This is when it gets interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the 1990s was perhaps the most important decade to Mercedes since Rudy Uhlenhout led them from post-war ruin to pre- after he was doing something. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? To preeminence in the 1950s. And it was and it would solidify the importance of its relationship with AMG. AMG continued to bring success in the German Touring Car Championship, winning its 50th race in only six seasons with Mercedes in 1993, and continued to see success until the series was canceled in 1996. These are some of my favorite cars, Mm -hmm. German Touring Cars, just like so sick. Great liveries, E30s were raced in there, very cool stuff. If anyone has any uh, Group A E30 mirrors, <laughs> I will buy them from you. In 1993, Mercedes made a tentative return to F1 with Sauber after nearly 40 years of absence and officially backed the team for the 94 season before leaving the Sauber partnership in 95 to sign a deal with McLaren to make their engines. McLaren Mercedes routinely competed for podiums in the first three seasons. Then in 1998 and 1999, driver Mika Hakkinen... Ooh won back-to-back drivers' championships for the team and helped them secure the 1998 Constructors' Championship in the process. Is this the guy that's really funny in interviews? Uh, I mean, he's... Oh, I'm thinking of Kimi Räikkönen. Kimi, Kimi Räikkönen. is really funny. Mika Häkkinen, he's an interesting guy, too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he ain't no slouch. I think I would get along with people in Finland. I think so, too. Yeah. I think you'd fit right in. I do you want to go to a sauna, <laughs> and then you want to drive through the woods really fast, and then go yeah, get Yeah, but not wasted? too fast, because they give speeding tickets based on income. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but yeah, you'd fit right in. <laughs> <laughs> you love smoked fish <laughs> <laughs> for Alfrecht and amg the 90s were of equal importance in addition to launching their first official contract car the c36 amg they began work on a car that Alfrecht has reflected upon as his quote best experience at his time with the company wow Designed for the new GT1 category in the 1997 FIA GT oh, yeah. Championship, Alfred and his AMG team planned the development of the CLK GTR in just 128 days using oh. a McLaren F1 GTR as a platform. This huh. is one of the coolest looking race cars it ever. Really yeah, is. this is iconic. And when I read that paragraph, when it was like, uh, it was like 336 AMG, I was like, oh, those are cool. Mm-hmm. And then he began work on. Uh, his best experience at the time, I was like, oh, cool. Maybe this thing's like under the radar. I can like get one. <laughs> <laughs> no. I didn't know that it used the F1 platform. I didn't either. That's very interesting. I knew that the F1, oh, which is weird because the McLaren F1 engine BMW. is a BMW. Right? Oh, yeah, that is weird. Huh. Everyone's in bed with oh, everyone's everyone. in bed with dude. But, German hey. racing is so incestuous, dude. <laughs> no, wait, wait. Just read a couple more sentences though. Oh. Including the bodywork and an AMG designed six liter V twelve. So they yanked that. They yanked that yeah. BMW one. And they out. made it into a coffee table. Yeah. yeah. It's like <laughs> yeah. who cares if this is the fastest car in the world for yeah. the next ten years? Dang. These things are so sick looking. Yeah. I had a Hot Wheels or something when I was a kid, and I always thought it was like the funkiest looking car ever. Well, I love when you take like a crazy race car, but you can see the street car mm-hmm. in it. Yes. Dude, this car like. What would you do for one, be, James? I don't know what I would do for one. I don't no, even know if me. like I would have any fun driving it, but. Probably not. I think I think this might be my favorite looking car ever. It's so oh, cool. Wow. 
I think it's the maybe the best looking car ever made. The CLK's entry in the championship series was a photo finish. It got approval only six days before the first race. That's what they call a nail biter. That's what the they call a nail yeah. biter, Joe. We got a lot of nail nail biters. At <laughs> <laughs> nail biters. Nail. That's what we a call lot of shoots are biter. like, oh, we can't do this unless we get this approved, but we're not going to know until the day before. Yeah. So it's yeah. just a little yeah. thing we like to call a nail biter, huh, Nolan? Yeah, you're right. It's basically like they just made a video basically yeah that's what they yeah, do like our, the work we do is basically the same basically they just ripped this yeah. off but they did it in 1998 <laughs> <laughs> big thanks to chime for sponsoring this episode of past gas i got a bunch of big stuff i want to buy for christmas for my loved ones my fiance my mom you know i'm gonna get them some nice stuff no matter what you're buying this season when you use the secured chime credit builder visa credit card you can build your credit scores with on-time payments for everyday purchases plus there's no annual fee interest or credit check to get started i know from experience it's really hard to build credit if you've never had a credit card before and that's why the chime credit builder visa credit card is great there's no annual fees interest or credit check to apply use it everywhere visa credit cards are accepted which is basically everywhere and build credit using your own money if you're not ready for a credit card there's always the chime checking account you can get paid up to two days early and with direct deposit so start building your credit open a chime checking account with at least a 200 dollars qualifying direct deposit to get started get started at chime.com gas that's chime.com gas Despite a few setbacks at the beginning of the 97 season, the car that took barely four months to build won the team's championship, scoring four 1-2 victories and six overall wins in the 10-race season, with driver Bernd Schneider winning the GT1 Drivers' Championship. In 1998, AMG Mercedes won the championship yet again, but this time they won all 10 races, with six of them, 1-2 finishes. Unfair. Unfair. What are you doing making a better car than everybody? <laughs> <laughs> the CLK's run of dominance was perhaps its own demise, as the GT1 category was suspended for the 1999 season following a lack of interest in manufacturers to compete in the category, likely to avoid racing. Yeah, no AMG. one wants to race that. Yeah, they took their ball and went home. So they're not so it, it, they're not using them anymore, so they're probably cheap. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'd probably find one. Yeah. Probably Go on a like 14 freaking grand. offer up. Offer up. <laughs> yeah. AMG CLK. Trade it for an Ooh. Xbox. Yeah. Someone made like, just like clapped out with like a Lightning McQueen livery on it. <laughs> it's, got it's got like got AutoZone air deflectors. Bullet it's holes. It says <laughs> bullet lo- hole stickers. Locally hated. <laughs> yeah. Locally hated on the windshield. <laughs> Dude, let's go to Ralph's. There's a meet tonight. <laughs> With the suspension of GT1, so were any obligations that homologation cars had to be built. But Alfrecht and AMG decided the CLK GTR would continue on through 1999 to honor the car's incredible achievements. The Strassen, or street version, was produced from 97 to 99 and was the first car ever developed entirely by AMG. This so cool, yeah. man. I want one of these. Yeah. I want one. I was raised on the Strassens. Don't <laughs> mess with me. <laughs> ah, you are not out here on these Strassens. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, what a unique looking car. Yeah. I it, love it. it does look like they took just like a Mercedes. And then mm-hmm. smashed it down. And Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like, like uh, you know, like so how you smash down. Like a Half smash browns. burger. Yeah. yeah it's like, it's yeah. like crispy and yeah. nice. Crispy edges are nice. Yeah. I like the crispy edges. Scattered, <laughs> smothered, and covered. Scattered, smothered, smothered and covered. And covered. <laughs> what, are you talking about crumpets again? You're talking, talking about, about my, my weekend? hash brown order from oh. Waffle House. Ooh. <laughs> chunked is when you add ham. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Scattered, Let me smothered, get a chunk. covered, and chunked. <laughs> <laughs> It essentially remained a race car. It had a six-speed, non-synchronous paddle shift transmission, a cramped cabin, and was powered by a 6.9-liter V12 that could launch the car from 0 to 60 in 3.8 seconds with a top speed of 214 miles per hour. I was going to say, that's too fast. It's too fast for you. too fast, man. Journalists adored the car and praised how poised it felt on the track despite how powerful it was. 
in the end, only 25 were made, and I own zero. <laughs> Unfairly, Mercedes and AMG closed their decade of successes with two major changes. On November 12th, 1998, Mercedes reached an amalgamation deal with Chrysler Corporation, becoming Daimler Chrysler AG and would share platforms, technology, and market access until the two split in 2007 during the Great Recession. In 1999, Alphix sold a majority interest in AMG to Mercedes, officially handing over control of the tuning brand. But Alphix, who had always been ready for the Mercedes star, <laughs> carried on his involvement in racing and performance engineering despite taking a step back at AMG. A year before the buyout, he founded HWA Race Lab, a company that would build and supply parts for Mercedes-AMG race cars, and in 2000 helped revive DTM, a German touring car championship. Cool. In 2021, uh, uh -huh. a CLK Strassen uh -huh. uh, went up for sale. Uh -huh. uh, I haven't been able to find any sales numbers, but it was expected to fetch between eight and a half hundred dollars <laughs> to eight and a half to ten million dollars. No! Come on, yeah. dude. That's way more than I can afford. Yeah. 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 One, oh! to, one to two million. You could, you know, cut back on cut stakes back on for dude, the week. I was, yeah. listen, honestly, <laughs> honestly, 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 I was hoping for about Fifteen to thirty grand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, then no, nobody wants them anymore. Yeah. Fudge. Uh, yeah, that's fudged up. <laughs> they also made a roadster version. It looks like. Mm. That means no top, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's sick as hell. That's sick as hell. Okay. In 2000, the company was again looking to reinvent the way people move themselves, much like Carl Benz, Gottler. Daimler and Wilhelm Maybach had done in the late 1800s. Those are the three most German names in the world. It's very... It feels like you're making squares with your mouth when you say these names for some reason. It's so diaphragm heavy. It's you're just like, Gottlieb, Gottlieb, Daimler. Daimler. And just as Rudi Uhlenhaut, Alfresh, and Melker had done, Mercedes would turn to the brand's illustrious past to inform its path to the future. How poetic is that? Building upon the work on alternative fuels that had done in the 70s, Mercedes spent the first part of the new millennium rolling out a fleet of alternative fuel-powered buses across Europe, Asia, and Australia. It also set out to prove its fuel cell technology by driving a hydrogen-powered vehicle, the NECAR 5, N-E-C-A-R, 3,265 miles from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., crossing hot deserts and snowy mountain passes to become the first fuel cell car to drive across a continent. Joe, two of Mercedes' most important cars of the 2000s were inspired by the now legendary designs from Rudolf Uhlenhaut. They debuted the SLR in 2003, the first car in the Mercedes lineup to carry the name since the 1955 Le Mans disaster, developed in conjunction with their F1 partner McLaren. Uh, 670 horsepower, supercharged 5.5 liter V8 Coupe was unveiled as the Tomorrow Silver Arrow, and the design was to be a road-going, closed-wheel approximation of their F1 cars. AMG also reintroduced Uhlenhaut's legendary 300 SL Gullwing as the SLS in 2010. I feel like since the AMG GT came out, the SLS has kind of like faded a little bit in the background, but I really like the SLS. That's SLS cool. is cool. They're awesome. Uh, Jay Leno has one of the uh, SLR McLarens. Ooh, wow. Pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. Those things look like some sort of knife. <laughs> it does look like it's like serrated and will gut you. Yeah, you know, like, like it's like a predator knife. Yeah, it's very it's a it's a it's alienish a, design. On, it's yeah, got gills yeah, on the side. Yeah, it's cool. It's like of the time though. It's like yeah. that like very, like you'd see that thousands neo chrome yeah. futurism. Yeah, there. you'd see it in like a little Wayne video on MTV and be oh, like, oh, yeah. he's rich. He's got yeah. that thing. Mm -hmm. Mercedes also carried on its tradition of motorsport dominance and providing a home for some of the best drivers in the history. Of motorsport. In 2007, McLaren Mercedes signed Lewis Hamilton to its F1 team, who would take the team to its greatest heights yet. But, I mean, they had talked years before that. He was in the Young Drivers mm -hmm. program. He had been in there, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right, Joe. After Impress, along with Nico Rosberg. Yeah. They were teammates back then as well. They didn't like each other after, though. No. No. After an impressive runner-up finish in the Drivers' Championship his rookie year, 
23-year-old Hamilton became the youngest world champion the next year in 2008. Mercedes took full control over the team in 2009 and rebranded the team to Mercedes-AMG in 2010, marking the official return of the Silver Arrows to F1 after 55 years. Do you think Lewis Hamilton has ever gone to see Hamilton on Broadway? <laughs> Honestly, he, he's, he's probably seen it. Yeah. Oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. He definitely has a pick of him in Lin Manuel. For sure. <laughs> I think that's a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> the playbill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> At the dawn of the turbo era in 2014. <laughs> Mercedes began an unprecedented run of success, securing a record-breaking seven consecutive constructors and drivers' championships, with Hamilton taking the title in six of those years and Nico Rosberg securing the seventh. AMG celebrated this incredible run by producing The One, a road car inspired by the F1 cars of this decade, complete with a 1.6-liter turbocharged V6 hybrid drivetrain. 1.6-liter V6? Boys. Yeah, and they're making like 1,000 horsepower. What the heck? Yeah. What the heck? Uh, okay, so I want you guys to Google Lewis Hamilton, Lin Manuel Miranda, okay. and I'm gonna guess. Look, I'm not looking at. Yeah. Okay. I didn't yeah, look yeah. it up. I'm gonna guess what Lewis is wearing. I bet he's okay. wearing some sort of matching like denimish suit, like pant jacket combo. Miranda. And based on like the timing of it, I think Images. he's probably got like uh, braids. I, uh, I'm no, not finding no, no, no Lin Manuel and no. I bet it's hard to find because his last name's Hamilton. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, we got to get those two guys together because that would be a riot. We do. What if <laughs> yeah. we were the ones that brought them together? Dude. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. And then they got married. <laughs> Lewis has. Uh, he's released a hip hop EP. He's really? rapped before on on tape. Hmm. Yeah. Mm. How is it? I haven't heard it not a huge fan of athletes doing music no Shaq is surprisingly good at not rapping. really his, <laughs> put his Shaq dude, in an he's F1 got car. a new track I've heard it it's the verse Was is it pretty the big, good big truck or something like that or like he's driving a big truck no, in the video uh, he's in like a low rider I think it's oh. like all CG animated right no he's That's not like enough actually good though he's like good I'll show you a verse that I've just, seen it I've seen it <laughs> just okay for a guy who does commentary on basketball games yeah. now, he did a pretty good job for an <laughs> old man whose job it is to talk about basketball who used to play basketball. Yeah. For that guy, uh -huh. he did a surprisingly good job rapping. But I want to remind you that, like, how good it can get oh, yeah. is like Kendrick Lamar. Oh, for sure. I know. So like that's he like did, that's like like if my uncle was as good as Shaq, I'd be like, whoa! But like he's not actually be astounded. Good. But yeah, that's like that's like comparing your aunt who picked up watercolor in her spare time to Picasso. You know? Well, it's yeah. Like, I just if yeah if we're okay, so he's not good. Just like my aunt <laughs> isn't good. <laughs> Like my, I'm not like my aunt's really good at watercolor. It's like no, my aunt like she's having fun. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you just have to be from the Strassens if you want. <laughs> and nice. dude, I'm a fuck, I'm a Diesel fan. I love Shaq. Yeah, I he's love my Shaq. he's my favorite dude, rapper. Went to LSU. Two of my idols, Shaq and Jackie Chan. I love Shaq, Shaqie Chan. <laughs> <laughs> you think Shaq's ever swallowed Jackie Chan? <laughs> <laughs> Just for fun? You know, I'd swallow, for sure. I'm going to swallow you, punch me as hard as you can in the belly, see if I throw up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good Shaq voice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Today, Mercedes has over 170,000 employees worldwide, 1,500 of which belong to AMG. They belong to me. At 84, Alfrecht is still involved with the German Touring Car Championship and HWA, which now builds and supplies parts for Mercedes-AMG GT cars, as well as Formula 2, 3, and E. You know, you do what you love and you never grow old. That's yeah. I say. That's a trick. <laughs> Make That's money, trick never get old. That they've treated. So, because yeah. you used to be allowed to retire. Yeah. yeah. And now they're, now like, they're not letting this guy... They Let won't. him rest. No, he probably did, but he's like a hundreds of millions of yeah. dollars here. Yeah. <laughs>
Melker, now 83, chose a quieter path. Speaking in a 2012 interview with Motorsport, uh, we said quieter path, and then next sentence he's speaking. <laughs> that was uh, 12 years ago. <laughs> speaking in a 2012 interview with Motorsport Magazine, it was obvious that notoriety and big business were never a priority of his. He recalled when Alfred asked him to leave Mercedes in early 1967 and said, I didn't want a family or a large company. I just wanted to make better engines. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> building upon the work. <laughs> building upon the work, it began in the 1970s. And in the spirit of its forward-thinking founders, Mercedes is currently working on transitioning their entire fleet of cars to electric power by 2030. Whew. With no new internal combustion platforms being introduced after 2025. In addition to manufacturing a fully electric vehicle for every segment it currently produces, it also plans to introduce three all-new platforms, including one designed specifically for performance, the AMG EA. It's in the game. EA <laughs> Sports. It, uh, it uh, requires a lot of uh, in-car purchases. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. You joke, but it's probably tr very true. Uh, the history of Mercedes-Benz is exciting and impressive in many parts, dark in others, and one of incredible innovation, foresight, and perseverance. Nearly 150 years ago, Carl Benz continually risked financial ruin due to his belief in an unproven technology. Bertha Benz believed in his technology when his faith wavered and proved to him and the public that this strange, horseless carriage was capable of the journeys people needed to make. Together with his rivals, Gottlieb Daimler and Wilhelm Maybach, they created an industry and continued to remain on the cutting edge of it. After the two rivals merged to weather a financial crisis in the late 1920s, they proved to be an even stronger force together. A dark period ensued through the 1930s and 40s when the company cooperated with and was infiltrated by the Nazi regime and contributed to the horrors of World War II. Infiltrated by? I think maybe they just... Well, remember, they kicked people out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, after being declared dead at the end of the war, engineers like Rudolf Uhlenhaut revived the brand's prestige and created cars like the Gullwing that continue to symbolize the brand 80 years later. In the 1960s, Hans Werner Alfrecht and Elhard Melker carried on Mercedes' storied racing history from the outside and brought high-end prestige to the brand. And through the end of the 20th century, Mercedes would celebrate its 100th birthday, experiment with alternative fuels, drive the adoption of new technologies, and make an incredible return to racing. After entering an official partnership with AMG and re-entering motorsport, it set the standard for performance and continues to do so in the 21st century. Today, with a history of 137 years in the making, the company continues to shape our modern world. The car is evolving once more, and Mercedes has helped lead the charge. From concept to creation, through countless evolutions and innovations, to influencing the built environment around us, the world has been forever changed by Mercedes-Benz. Ooh, ooh. Well said. Well ooh. put, dude. What a sick company, except for, you know, that time when they were Just not that period of time they yeah. dropped except off the, the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, this whole series is really put in perspective how influential. Yeah, I, I feel like for me, Mercedes is like one of those brands where I, I really respect them and I love their mm -hmm. cars. The ones I've gotten to driv drive, I'd really love. But... Mm -hmm. uh, their presence is kind of a given, yeah, you know, right, yeah. and it, I liked going through the story and kind of refreshing and uh, reintroducing their legacy to Allow ourselves. me to reintroduce myself. Exactly. My name is Benz. Exactly. So that was really fun. I love Mercedes Benz. They're me too. just big old rippers, big old raunchy yeah. V8s in them. They helped reignite the like muscle car era of the early 2000s too mm -hmm. with the, all the AMG stuff is... Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, they're just kind of like sneaky horsepower cars yeah. a little bit. They're it's one like, of the oh, reasons. yeah, we're fancy, but also, ah! Ah, Yeah, here's a 6.3 liter V8, yeah. and then rips, you know? Rips. And then, like, rips. all of uh, the Paganis have Mercedes V12s in them, too. Mm -hmm. So, sneaky, sneaky fast. Super fun. Super all right. Fun. We got some listener mail this week. Hey, guys, love the podcast and all the work you do. Also, congrats to Nolan, James, and Joe for getting engaged. Two other people. Yeah. 
<laughs> he does note, sadly, not to each other. Nice. Getting down to business, I'd like to offer my $150 bicycle, roughly 23 cents in spare change, and a firm handshake in exchange for your toes. What? So this is in reference to uh, James's offer. Yeah. Or, uh, Dude, there's girls out there making like 100 grand a month. I know. On toes. James... Pumphrey is an awesome last name. It's yours, and you should be proud. Though, if you if you were looking to change it, I think Beauregard would be Beauregard. a solid Beauregard. Beauregard. James Beauregard's pretty That's good. Sick. Would be a solid substitute. Doesn't solve my problem of having to spell it all the time. Yeah. Though. Uh, James Kentucky Cobra Beauregard. Beauregard. Beauregard, Beauregard See? sounds classy. <laughs> See, where I'd be doing yeah. that all yeah. the time. Uh, keep it juiced. Gout him. Gout him. Gout him. Uh, in, in other news, my new nickname is uh, Joe Nail. Joe Nail. <laughs> Joe Nail. Because I'm gonna have a toe empire. I get pictures oh, yeah. of all your toes. Joe Nail. Because he's a fun guy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that was super fun. Su bit, huge thank you to our writer and researcher Audrey Holden uh, for doing this whole series. Now she's a, she's a Mercedes expert now. Yeah. That uh, was really fun. Really great series. Big thanks to our producers this week, uh, Christina Felski, Paul O'Mara, and Nick Giamuso behind the cameras. And another thank you to you, dear listener slash watcher, for uh, taking this journey with us. Follow James at James Pumphrey on all social media. Uh, Kentucky Cobra on, on TikTok? Yeah. Kentucky Cobra on TikTok. Joe Weber... Joe G. G. Weber G. on social media. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes, and we'll see you in around the, the pictures. Bend. On we'll your toes. We'll see you at the movies.